Welcome back to BE 110. Today we're going to derive the equations of motion for the special case of linear elasticity and thereby obtain the equations of linear elastostatics for the case of equilibrium and linear elastodynamics. So first, considering the case of static equilibrium, we'll consider a linearly elastic isotropic Hookean solid in static equilibrium. Conservation of linear momentum for a continuum will read the divergence of the stress plus rho times the body force is equal to zero. In the absence of the body forces, so b equals zero, the conservation of linear momentum simplifies to the divergence of the stress, or del Tji del Xj is equal to zero. So those are the three force balance equations for static equilibrium in the absence of body forces. Now the constitutive equation for linear elasticity of an isotropic Hookian solid states that the stress T is equal to lambda times I, the identity tensor, times the trace of the Cauchy strain, plus 2 mu times the Cauchy strain, or an index notation, Tij equals lambda epsilon kk times delta ij, plus 2 mu epsilon ij. And then the strain displacement relation, namely the kinematic equations that define the Cauchy strain tensor is epsilon equals one-half g plus g transpose where g is the displacement gradient tensor or an index notation epsilon ij equals one-half del ui del xj plus del uj del xi. So the unknowns in this problem are the displacement components u, which are the dependent variables. What we're going to do is substitute the strain equation into the constitutive law for stress to get the stress in terms of the displacement gradients, and then substitute the stress into the equilibrium equation to get uh, a differential equation for the uh, dependent displacement variables. So substituting strain into the constitutive law, we would now get Tij equals lambda del uk del xk times delta ij plus mu times del ui del xj plus del uj del xi. Now substituting this equation for the stress as a function of the displacement components into the equilibrium equations, which are del Tji del Xj equals zero, we'll get that del Tji del Xj is equal to del del Xj of lambda times del Uk del Xk times delta Ij plus mu times del uj del xi plus del ui del xj. Notice the i's and j's are switched here because this is del tji del xj. So this gives us lambda times the second derivative del 2uk del xj del xk plus mu times del 2 uj del xi del xj plus mu times del 2 ui del xj del xj. Now notice that this term and this term are actually the same. The only thing is that's different is the dummy variable. Here it's a k, here it's a j, but it means the same thing, a summation. So we can rewrite this as 
lambda delta uk del xi del xk plus mu times delta uk del xi del xk, where all we've done is change this dummy variable j to a k without changing the meaning of the equation, plus mu times delta ui del xj del xj. So now we can collect these two terms together, giving us del tji del xj is equal to lambda plus mu times del 2 uk del xi del xk. plus mu times del 2 ui del xj del xj. So therefore, so therefore the equilibrium equations become lambda plus mu times del 2 uk del xi del xk plus mu del 2 ui del xj del xj is equal to zero. Or writing this in direct notation, we'll see that del uk del xk here is the divergence of u. So this term here is the gradient of the divergence of u. So we get lambda plus mu times grad div u. Similarly, this term here is actually the divergence of the gradient of u, so this is mu div grad u is equal to zero. Now, div grad u is also the Laplacian, so we can write our equation as lambda plus mu times grad div u plus mu Laplacian of u is equal to zero. Now we can also note that the divergence of u here is del ui del xi, which is the same as epsilon ii, or the trace of epsilon, which is e, the dilatation, or the infinitesimal volume change. So we can therefore also rewrite this equation as lambda plus mu times grad e plus mu times Laplacian of u is equal to zero. Notice the gradient of the scalar is a vector, Laplacian of this vector is a vector, so this is still three equations. And it would be easy to generalize these equations to include the body forces simply by adding in rho b, and thus we would obtain lambda plus mu times grad e the dilatation, plus mu times the Laplacian of u, plus rho times b is equal to zero. And these are the equations of linear elastostatics for isotropic Hookean elastic solid. So in summary, what we've done here is substituted the strain displacement relation which are first-order partial differential equations in the dis displacements u, into the linear stress-strain law, which are algebraic equations for the stress, and then substituted the resulting first-order linear partial differential equations into the three equilibrium equations, which themselves are also linear first-order partial differential equations, thereby obtaining three linear second-order partial differential equations in U, as seen here. So we have three linear partial differential equations in three uh, unknown or dependent variables, which are the displacement components U. Now we have to consider the boundary conditions there are two types of boundary condition for this second order problem. So the first we would call from applied mathematics the Dirichlet boundary conditions. These are boundary conditions on the values of u, i.e. they are the prescribed displacements. These are sometimes called the essential boundary conditions because it's essential that we constrain or um, uh, prescribe uh, 
at least enough displacements to prevent a rigid body motion, since um, they are essentially just a constant of integration in this problem. So otherwise, without uh, displacement boundary conditions, we can't get a solution to within an arbitrary rigid body motion. Now the second type of boundary conditions are the Neumann or derivative boundary conditions. So these would be prescribed values of the derivatives of the U. And occasionally these would be the boundary conditions, but the derivatives of displacement give the strain. And from the strain, we can get the stress via the constitutive law. And stresses on the boundary surfaces correspond to tractions. So the second type of boundary condition that is typically found in these problems are traction boundary conditions. So mathematically, these are derivative boundary conditions, but physically, these would be traction or force boundary conditions. So in order to get a unique solution to these equations of linear elastostatics, we need to have um, boundary conditions, either displacement boundary conditions or traction boundary conditions, everywhere on the surface. Once we've solved the equations for U, we can then differentiate to get the strains, and from the strains we can substitute them back into the constitutive law to get the stress components. So we can now generalize this fairly readily to the case where the body is not in equilibrium uh, and where we get, instead of linear elastostatics, linear elastodynamics. The only additional term here is the inertial forces, rho times the accelerations, uh, the material derivative of the velocity with respect to time. So the left-hand side remains the same, and we have lambda plus mu times grad of div u plus mu times Laplacian of u plus rho times the body forces b is equal to rho times the accelerations dv dt. But it's not quite this simple because the accelerations ai are the material derivatives of the velocity components, which is the partial derivatives del vi del t plus vj del vi del xj. And this second term is nonlinear, this convective acceleration term. However, if v and the, its gradients are sufficiently small that their product becomes vanishingly small, then we can linearize by ignoring this term. And so in the linear limit, the acceleration simplifies to del vi del t, and v is del u del t, so the acceleration is del 2 ui del t squared, and the governing equations of linear elastodynamics are lambda plus mu times grad of div u plus mu times Laplacian of u plus rho times b plus equals rho times del 2 u del t squared. And these are often referred to as Navier's equations. And they can be used to solve a wide variety of problems, including uh, wave propagation in elastic sol linearly elastic solids and many other problems. So we'll see some examples of boundary value problems in uh, elasticity and linear elasticity in class.